Our next speaker here is Roland, who is an active part of our local tech community. He is one of the guys that really runs the hackerspace. He is mentoring startups. He's working on his own Haze Index and keeps track of how bad the weather really is. And today he's going to talk a little bit about maybe communicating with the moon. I just hope you're not trying to order cheese, because it's not actually cheese. <laughs> My disappointment is inexpressible. Uh, so, <laughs> what do you mean the moon's not made of cheese? Okay, hi. So, um, the talk, as, uh, as Bill, is to use, and it's, this is via amateur radio is the means, but to talk via satellites and perhaps via the moon. This is essentially part two uh, of a talk series that I started at Hackware earlier this year. And so for the benefit of those in the room who weren't there, I will do a quick recap of part of that. And it's, yeah, per Harish's uh, comments, what is amateur radio? Broadly speaking, we break radio emissions from devices in use into three categories. The first is things that are not uh, transmitting a signal. So the electric motors in a drill or a toothbrush that emit noise. So these don't count. They're treated separately as uh, EM noise. The second is intentional transmitters that can be operated on a license-free basis. Uh, these are all low-power devices. The common case are the industrial, scientific, scientific, and medical bands. The examples we're all most familiar with are Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. But Zigbee's, garage door controllers, wireless microphones, uh, all of these devices use a allocated set of frequencies at very low power levels. But they mean that although the device has to be type approved, the person using it doesn't have to have a license. The other broad category is licensed use. And so broadly speaking, these are the four major groups. Broadcasters uh, use a lot of power and would like to use spectrum as, as much as possible to reach their audiences. Regulators get involved to curtail interference with each other. Mobile network operators are also making a lot of money out of uh, selling wireless communication. They would like to use as much spectrum as they can get their hands on. And again, regulators curtail that. Marine, aeronautical, and land mobile are generally not engineering organizations. So unlike the broadcasters and the, the telcos, these are people who run truck fleets, run plane fleets, run boats. Uh, what they want is a device that they can buy off the shelf and use and know it'll work. And so again, regulators control a whole lot of stuff about how that works so you can buy off the shelf gear and just use it. Amateurs are in a slightly different spot. The, in order to become an amateur, you, you need to do uh, a little light reading <laughs> and pass an exam um, so <laughs> that you have the technical knowledge to do the same engineering that the, the broadcasters or the telcos are doing, albeit at a, a smaller scale, to, to build and operate your own equipment. So there is an element of DIY. Not everyone does it. And in, at the moment in Singapore, almost no one operates on a DIY basis. They tend to be off-the-shelf radios. I am hoping to change that. And it's part of why I'm addressing the tech community broadly rather than just within SARTs. Um, oh, wonderful, thank you. So really brief timeline to get a sense of perspective. Phone was invented in the 18, late 1870s, broadcast radio pretty quickly after that, actually, uh, 1905. Within a decade, there, were there was an amateur licensing arrangement in place. This was during World War I, so a century ago this year, that there were people who wanted to play with it and that the needs to avoid interfering with each other became apparent. And so amateur licensing is, has been going on for a century. Um, roll forward, however, and the use of radio for communication, for, for amateur radio for communication, starts to look a bit strange. Um, the early phases of the internet, DARPANET in particular, came into being in 69. Cellular mobile in 79, mobile internet in 96, and sort of over the last few years, ubiquitous mobile internet. And so we now have internet literally everywhere and smartphones in our pockets. And this sort of asks, well, why bother? What would, why would you go through the inconvenience of licensing, of pa studying, passing an exam, and then licensing before you can use this thing? And of course, you know, <laughs> even fairly simple radios are, they're older tech and bulkier than mobile phones. So there's, there are sort of, a, you need to ask why do it. Um, so start out by demarking it. This is RDA's definition. It's pretty close to the definition used in other jurisdictions. Uh, 
self-training into communication, technical investigations, and carried out by amateurs, that is to say, without pecuniary interest. If you take out the intercommunication element, the other three elements look an awful lot like the maker movement. Why do you go and program an Arduino and connect flashing lights, robots, whatever, There's, when you go and buy stuff off the shelf? A big part of the answer is that creating stuff with technology and mastering it is rewarding by itself. The other is, it allows you to do some things you can't do with a phone network, and I'll come back to that in a moment. It's difficult to give a straight answer on why uh, do amateur radio, because amateurs do a whole lot of different things. Because it's personal hobbies, personal interests, it can be across an immense range. The public service one is largely about emergency communications, and in fact, in the US, uh, AWL members compete on their ability to process message traffic while operating off-grid. They do a field day once a year, and then they're counting the number of messages they get to pass all over the US and all over the world. And yes, there are awards for things like how many countries they contacted. And as Harish mentioned, there are so few amateurs in Singapore that it's one of the hardest populated countries in the world to make a connection with. There are fewer than 100 amateurs here. Uh, long distance was the original use, using the ionosphere as a, as a duct. So you can get halfway around the world without infrastructure. So this is, again, part of the answer to Harish's question. If the network is down, one of the answers is, if you have the right gear and the huge antenna, you can literally use the ionosphere as a communication channel. Uh, repeaters are a solution to particularly urban problems, where if you have a handheld radio, you want to talk to someone with a handheld radio, and there's a building in the way, you can't. So you stick a thing up on a high place that allows communication between the two. Uh, of course, you can also stick such a thing on a rocket and put it into orbit. And uh, we'll attempt communication with one of those later today. Uh, so a lot of there's about 15 to 20 amateur satellites uh, in orbit and a couple of other satellites that will carry amateur traffic, including the ISS. And in fact, more than half of the astronauts on the ISS have amateur licenses. So it's not just a repeater. There's also an amateur station on the ISS. And occasionally, it's possible to talk to astronauts. Uh, low power is a technical challenge. is fascinating. People are communicating incredible distances on very small amounts of power. Uh, I'm particularly interested in moon bounce or Earth, moon, Earth. So this is communicating from Earth to Earth using the moon itself as a passive reflector, which I'll talk about towards the end of this talk. Um, Joe Gonzalez over here, who uh, we pointed out earlier, is uh, doing a variety of things, particularly including high-altitude balloons, which he spoke on on Thursday. Sadly, his stay in Singapore ends too soon to have him talk in hackerspace. Uh, meteor scatter, so that there are amateurs waiting for meteors to enter the atmosphere and make use of the, ion the ionized trail they leave behind them to bounce radio waves off. You have to be quick. <laughs> For those who are not quite that quick, uh, there are, or there were, in Sydney and Melbourne amateurs who were using aircraft as reflectors. So 747 flying from one to the other, they know exactly where it is, and the signal strength at that time is very weak, uh, so it doesn't interfere with the avionics, but it's possible to, if you point both antennas, to communicate by bouncing radio waves off an of aircraft. Uh, direction finding and fox hunting, this is more uh, an event thing, which might be appropriate to do in a geek camp one year where you hide a fox and people go looking for it and use uh, direction antennas to try and work out where it is. And mountain topping, uh, I didn't include my photo, is, is a sort of put yourself in the position of the repeater and talk to amateurs at great distances. Broadly speaking, I, I may have missed a couple, but I thought about it for a while, there are these four things that amateur radio allows you to do that the phone networks can't do and will never be able to do. So this, this niche remains, how important it is, is, a, is a open to debate. The big one is operate when the network isn't there. You go into a disaster zone where communication networks are knocked out, power networks are knocked out, road networks are knocked out, and amateurs can and do walk in with enough gear to get at least emergency communication up and running, even before road networks get fixed, let alone power and comms networks. Uh, operating in places where the network doesn't exist. So the, the satellite and, and moon bounce things I'm going to talk about are uh, places where the mobile network just doesn't go and won't. Uh, DIY radio electronics. In pretty well all jurisdictions, it is illegal to produce radios that are capable of communicating directly on the mobile network. You must use type-approved gear produced by manufacturers in bulk and tested. So if you want to actually tinker with the radio production and, and decoding yourself, you need to do it somewhere other than the mobile network. And finally, although I won't touch it today, uh, high power operation. Even in Singapore, which is a dense environment and therefore constrained, there are amateurs operating at 300 watts, whereas the, the Wi-Fi module in my laptop is half a watt. In the US and Western Europe, 1,500 watts. So there's a, for certain kinds of operation, particularly the ionosphere, 
uh, more power is necessary, this is never ever going to be an application for the mobile network. So, um, certainly the focus for today's talk is primarily satellite communications. And the first thing you have to do if you, if you wish to talk to a satellite is predict where it's going to be. Uh, you need a somewhat directional antenna. Uh, this is one that's intended specifically for amateur use. And so you quite literally are pointing it as an at a satellite as it goes past. You can't see it. So you need to know where it is in advance. There's uh, NORAD tracks thousands of objects and publishes that data. And then there's prediction software to make use of that data to work out where a satellite is from your perspective. When it will rise, at what angle it will rise, and so forth. The next problem is uh, orientation. So the you historically radio was done with vertical antennas. And so your transmitting antenna is making a signal go like this, and your receiving antenna is sitting in the, uh, the right orientation to receive it. If you're if your transmitting antenna is making a field this way and your receiving antenna is this way, you receive nothing. So with amateur satellites in particular, they're typically, or a lot of them, about the size of a shoebox. They don't have good attitude control. In fact, they don't have any attitude control. They're just tumbling through space. And so the, the polarization of the antenna is both unpredictable and changing. And so you need to sort of, with the handheld one, uh, turn until you get a match. Uh, the other way of dealing with this is, in fact, simply to have two. And so I am working towards building this device. The parts finally arrived yesterday, so I have nothing to show on it today. But it's solved the problem of having two of the antennas with the uh, elements at right angles, which means you can deal with any polarization at all of whatever orientation the satellite has. But yes, uh, for the moment, it's freehand, single polarization, and a lot tougher to make work. The next problem is Doppler correction. Uh, the Doppler effect is the tendency for uh, a signal to appear to have a higher frequency than it should have when it comes towards you and a lower frequency when it goes away. This applies to audio signals when a car or a train is approaching or receding. But satellites are moving so fast, compared to the ground about 20,000 kilometers an hour, that it affects radio waves as well. And so you're looking at several kilohertz of, I beg your pardon, several megahertz, no, sorry, several kilohertz of uh, Doppler effect. So you're actually having to, at least for the downlink, having to change the frequency of your radio as it makes a pass. So there's quite a few things that you have to get right all at the same time. Even if you get all this stuff perfect, every one of these things spot on, there remains one other serious problem, and this is called hidden transmitter. So imagine in a simplified environment, you've got three people communicating with radios with the same range. A and C are both close enough to B that B can see both of them, but A can't see C and C can't see A. If A and C both start, so you listen before you transmit, it's polite. So A and C both do that, they hear nothing, they start transmitting. B is suddenly hearing two people talking at the same time and can make no sense of it. The same thing comes up for satellites, in particular because the satellite has very much the high ground and can see quite a, a large area. And so the way you solve this problem is, and the way you compensate for most of the other ones, is to operate full duplex. And so, that, so some radios are capable of sending and receiving at the same time. Um, I don't own such a radio, so instead I use two. And so the idea is that you are listening to what's coming down from the satellite the whole time, and then when you're transmitting, you're expecting to hear your own voice come back to you through the other radio. And if you don't hear that, then you know you're not talking to the satellite, you're pointing in the wrong direction, or your orientation's wrong, or something. But also, uh, if someone else is, is trying to communicate while you're speaking, you'll hear it. And this matters because, particularly because of the, the rate at which the passes occur, it'll cross the sky from your perspective in a few minutes. But there's a whole lot of marginal stuff happening at the same time in other parts of, other parts of the region. It means you get to understand that someone else is trying to communicate at the same time. And so particularly in areas where satellite communication is popular, which does not describe Singapore, um, but say the US, you just get massive pileups where dozens of people are trying to talk at the same time. And in, I mentioned the ISS, they have this problem, that the moment they are within sight of any part of the mainland US, the radio just lights up. And so there's this whole problem of, of coordinating that. And one of the major, one of the primary controls is that just about everyone operates full duplex. You can do it without, but it's, it's kind of rude. Um, however, full duplex creates a problem. And you can hear the, the humming in the background as this microphone and the speakers interact. So in a, in a satellite, you've got a repeater that's receiving on one frequency, 
taking that signal and sending it on another, if those two frequencies are very close together and the, and the satellite is the size of a shoebox, there's going to be bleed over from the transmitter back into the receiver and you'll get this same sort of humming happening internally to the satellite. So the way you solve that problem is you operate the two halves of the communication on two different bands. And so again, looking at this antenna, the, the long uh, 2 meter or about 144 megahertz uh, elements that are used for the uplink, and then the short ones are 70 centimeter or about 430 megahertz used for the downlink. And it means that, although this is bulky on the ground, in the satellite, the electronics to separate the transmitted and received signal in a way that they don't interfere with each other is much smaller and much lighter than it would otherwise be. So there's about, they're the major sort of six or eight problems, but it's a, it's a slightly fiddly thing to do. Uh, that said, uh, compared to what I actually want to do, what I've just described to you is relatively simple. What I really want to do is bounce radio signals off the moon. And uh, <laughs> at this point, I think it might not work, but we'll see. The satellites are about 500 kilometers away, typically. Some closer, some a bit further. The moon is 380,000 kilometers away. But it doesn't have a repeater on it. So in reality, the path we're talking about is three quarters of a million kilometers. Uh, the inverse squares law applies. So the, the, the amount of um, field strength loss varies with the square of the distance. So you take something that works at 500 kilometers and now increase the distance 1,500 fold, which is the moon and back, and you're now down in the, whatever that is, the, can't do it, the two millionth of the signal level. Um, and so you're talking about a trillion trillionth, 10 to the minus 24, of the signal you send will come back to you. In fact, it's slightly, well, that's just free space path loss. It's slightly worse because the moon itself is not a very smooth reflector. And so you lose about 90% of what little hits the, hits the moon. It's called libration noise. You, so there's loss there as well. So you're getting back about 10 to the minus 25 of what you send. There is nothing in human experience to make sense of that number. It is a preposterously tiny number. It's the difference between a gunshot and a... not even a nuclear weapon. I mean, it, it's a staggeringly gigantic number. So... It, is, it does mean you're dealing with de decoding a really, really weak signal. So the first rule of weak signal work is that everything in the universe generates noise, and everything turns out to be an extremely long list. Um, here is just a handful of the things that generate noise that you have to worry about if you're attempting Earth, Moon, Earth. The transmitters, oscillator, modulator, transmission line, and antenna are all things that may introduce noise. Uh, the lunar surface's unevenness, what's called libration, um, in addition to not reflecting well, it also reduces uh, irregularity in the, the reflected signal. It's the difference between a smooth mirror and a crumpled bit of alfoil. Uh, the signal levels involved are so low that the Milky Way itself becomes a problem. Oh, no, I skipped one. Moonshine. So in a full moon, what you're seeing is, is visible light from the sun that's being reflected by the moon. But the sun's not only emitting visible light, it's also emitting right across the EM spectrum, including on the frequencies that I want to operate. And so if you try to do Earth moon bounce during full moon, you've got a massive amount of interference from the sun. That, that, all that light that's coming from the moon also includes a bunch of, of uh, radio. But worse, the signal levels involved are so small that the Milky Way in the background is a problem. And so you either need a 64 meter dish which allow you to focus something small on the moon and, and point it correctly, which is quite a hard problem, or you choose the time when you're doing it so that it's both a new moon and the moon is not in the Milky Way. It's going to be somewhere other than where the Milky Way is that night. Uh, the antenna itself, of course, is made of metal. It's somewhere above zero Kelvin, so it introduces noise. The antenna's transmission line and the receiver's preamp. So the first stage of the receiver is typically sitting up in the focus of a dish or somewhere similar because you don't want a transmission line. And so it's, in fact, in, in satellite TV systems, it's called the low noise block. It's a thing that tries to capture what little signal there is and then amplify it, and in doing so, to not increase the total amount of noise or, the, the, or to worsen the signal noise ratio. So I have in mind a few pieces to uh, tackle this problem. The first is something that the amateur community seems to have overlooked completely, which means it's either a good idea or a terrible one. Um, called a Fresnel zone plate antenna. Uh, this is not quite the right way to describe it, but 
Um, I first encountered this as a design in an 80s electronics magazine for making a working satellite TV antenna out of a sheet of plywood. And so <laughs> you cut away the pieces that, you, that, that are white in this, this diagram, paint the rest with aluminium roof paint. And you've got a reflector, and then you mount a, a patch antenna at the right height, and you've got a... And so it's, what's going on is um, uh, phase error or phase differences, meaning that different reflections either uh, support or, or interfere, and you've cut away the bits that will create interference. And so you end up with reflections that, su that are uh, accretive or that strengthen the overall signal. Ten minutes, cool. So the, the joy of this is it's flat, which means it scales cheaply. And so this is the, in, uh, the abstract I talked about, a football field sized antenna. It, whereas a dish gets goes up by something, an exponential. If you go from a dish this big up to a dish that's 10 meters across, you go from being a $500 device to being a $5 million device. If you're making a flat reflector, then it, the cost goes up by the, the surface area of the area that you're putting the reflector on. So in principle, you can put a flat reflector on a football field somewhere. You do need to put a driven element somewhere up high. So I'm sort of looking for a football field next to an ATV block. So I can put the, the driven element up on someone's antenna, um, balcony. There's a bunch of other problems. I might not actually get to build this thing, in particular because land is a problem in this country. But it's an area that uh, means that you can massively increase the aperture. The larger the size of your reflector, the more signal you have to work with in the first place compared to background noise. And so it's a much cheaper way of doing it than other options. Uh, the next is a little more obscure. It's called a high electron mobility transistor. And I'm really going to have to do some hand waving, but the guts of it is that um, in between the two um, impurity-laden layers of silicon that provide a junction, uh, the, the, the way transistors work, you, you inject impurities into the silicon, those impurities are one solid dissolved into another. They create unevenness in the behavior of the silicon, which is to say they introduce noise. And low noise work is all about get, low signal work is all about getting rid of the noise. So the solution, which sounds great, is ridiculous and it works, is in between the two layers of doped silicon, you put a layer of gallium or uh, arsenide or whatever, something similar, which happens to have a higher electron affinity. And so it's actually stealing electrons from the end doped silicon and doing so statically, even when turned off. So you end up with the layer in which the switching is occurring, not having any impurities, so there's no noise introduced by the doped silicon, and also it's stolen a bunch of electrons from the end doped silicon, so you've got a gas of, el of electrons available. So it's also very sensitive and very fast. So this is used in preamps for satellite communication. And because it's also used in mobile phone towers, and consequently they're cheap. This is not a $1,000 transistor. It's a $5 transistor, and Element 14 has them in stock. So <laughs> that needs to be looked at. Uh, liquid nitrogen I don't think I'll get to use. But the problem that it solves is if you reduce the temperature of your preamp, then you reduce the amount of thermal noise at that point where you're dealing with the weakest signal in the whole system. Liquid nitrogen happens to be about a quarter room temperature. Room temperature is, call it 25, 30 degrees, or about 300 Kelvin. Liquid nitrogen is about 75 Kelvin, 77, I think. So if you reduce your temperature by three quarters, you also reduce the noise at that most sensitive part of the system by about three quarters. And that improves the ability to get over this horrible signal loss. So I am not the first to think of this. This is a dish... I'm not sure where it is, uh, in the 60s, where they had a supply of liquid nitrogen in the low-noise block at the focus and periodically had to dip the dish and send someone up in this giant cherry picker with a dewer full of liquid nitrogen and restock. <laughs> I don't know if it was daily or weekly, but they were just periodically restocking it with liquid nitrogen in order to allow the low-noise block to run at one quarter of regular temperature and therefore to improve the signal-to-noise ratio fourfold. Liquid nitrogen is so hard to handle that I might not get to do this. Um, the other problem is that what you're getting back is still far below what we normally think of as the noise threshold. And so we, we have a modulation produced by a radio astronomer who's also an amateur um, called JT65, uh, Joel, Joe Taylor, Joel Taylor, can't recall his name. Uh, it's a 65-tone system. Uh, the 12-byte payload you'll send with this takes about a minute to transmit. So if you thought Twitter was verbose, tweets are a bit large for your liking, here's a format for you. Um, 
When you're doing Earth Moon Earth, the, what you're getting back is so weak that you can't receive the signal in the usual sense. There are other uses for JT65 on Earth, but when you're doing Earth Moon Earth, you're now in a whole different realm of difficulty. And in fact, it was built for this problem, that you're way below the noise floor. So you're actually taking a bunch of noise and then performing some mathematics on it to estimate potential messages. And you either get back a nothing or a, oh, look, here's one. And at this point, I think he was showing off. Uh, the guy who, who devised this means of modulation made it possible to pull out several messages simultaneously. This matters because the entire world shares one moon, so you've got a bunch of amateurs potentially transmitting on the same frequency in the same minute. And so you might be pulling out half a dozen messages at the same time. And that's, so it, it's, it's sort of radio with mathematics on the back. Um, right, before I wrap up, uh, do want to introduce briefly Joe, yep, that's cool. Uh, Joe Gonzalez, VK3 uh, YSP. Joe, want to stand up briefly? Jo Joe is visiting us. Uh, he, I couldn't get him into the <laughs> into today's schedule. He's, he spoke about uh, high altitude ballooning uh, balloon releases on Thursday at the Amateur Radio Club meeting, uh, and possibly will set up on a table outside to sort of show off some gear. But it's this gear, clearly not packaged quite this way, but uh, an Arduino, a GPS receiver. Uh, a digital, uh, a mineral transmitter, let's say, um, packed into a foam ball, attached to weather balloon, and pushed up to about 50 kilometers. And again, amateur radio is used as the means of receiving telemetry trauma in real time, rather than depending upon being able to recover it and pull a, uh, a module, a memory module out. And also, of course, to work out where it landed. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't have either amateur or mobile, then finding it, and it traveled 50 kilometers, then finding where it landed is going to take you some time. Uh, so finally, before I take any questions, uh, I'm going to attempt a live demonstration um, between about 1 and 1.30 in the fire assembly area just outside. Um, I re regret to advise it's probably not going to work. Uh, I have a regulatory issue that I haven't yet overcome with IDA. Uh, so <laughs> it's welcome to a hobby that needs permission. But uh, you are certainly welcome to come out and, and watch us try. Uh, with that, uh, I'll, do I still have two minutes? So I guess three, a couple of questions. Any questions? Did this make sense? <laughs> What's the thing? Hang on. Uh, is there a reason why you've chosen to do this in Singapore when the, most of the community for this kind of thing is not here? <laughs> it's, it's even so. Yeah, two, two problems. One, there's no community for it in Singapore, and, and two, uh, the constraints of being in a dense urban environment uh, make it even harder. So the, the major uh, moon mount stations in the US and in Europe are in, in rural areas where antenna arrays the size of a building can be set up. Uh, mostly that I live here and that I've wanted to do this for about 15 years. And it happens that I'm now living in one place and willing to start accumulating all the gear required to do it. Yes, I recognize that I've now taken on uh, a possibly insuperable set of obstacles, both regulatory and physical, uh, getting the space to build a, either an antenna array or a, the, the zone plate reflector, uh, dealing with power limits. The power limits are much lower if you're close to people. So we'll see. Half, that's half of why I do it, though. Right? The, if, if I was just doing something that had been done before, I'd be like, well, why bother? So there is new ground to be cut here. And the other thing is, with moon bounce in particular, um, it doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> as long as you're on the same half of the planet, it's, you, it's fine. Satellite is different. The satellites pass over and they're quiet, which means they're harder to find. In the US is easy. The satellites, while they're overhead, are working nonstop. So the moment you point your antenna the right way, you've got a, a clear signal. So that's an irritation. But it's, it's partly the fact that it does mean solving problems that haven't been solved before by anyone, as far as I can tell, uh, makes it worthwhile. Harish. Uh, no, just a question about... Um uh, the, the signal is coming back from satellites which are much further away. Have you, have you picked up anything from any of the other... Uh, <laughs> I haven't picked up local... I haven't picked up the easy satellites yet. I'll, I'll get to the, let's I mean, just curious. So no, um, so there's a whole lot of problems uh, and indeed the, the use of a handheld antenna is easier in environments where there's a lot of use exactly because the moment you swing past the satellite you, you get a, a positive lock because the satellites are in continuous use. Here, they're quiet. And so it's going to be harder to find them. So the solution to that problem is to actually build the elevator and rotator that I showed you earlier, which I have just got the parts for. 
um, which means that I am confident that I have the antenna pointing the right way. I think what we can do is we have to have in, you know, like the long, long range uh, aperture, the, the ones that have multiple satellite dishes, so they have very large aperture. I've, I've looked at very large aperture so designs have, and... In Singapore itself, you have a few people, you know, you are more or less in a line of cycle. Sing Singapore is probably one of the few cities in the world where that's feasible for people who aren't governments, and it's because you need immense bandwidth between them. So the fact that we've got gigabit fibre available inexpensively would be the baseline for that. So yes, that experiment intrigues me, and certainly for stuff like listening in on uh, stuff orbiting Mars, that comes up. But again, right now I'm starting with stuff that's a bit closer and that I haven't yet managed to communicate with. So <laughs> one, one, one step at a time. Just one small, I mean, one of the interesting uh, bit of history is that we had, for the longest period of time, um, the, one more. the guys in the International Space uh, Station was picking up, uh, this was in the days when, uh, before we had handphones and so on, the uh, radio bookings from the taxi companies in Singapore. <laughs> because they were operating on the ham radio bands. Wow. Yeah, don't ask me why, but that's what they were doing. And so the signal was strong enough that it wasn't picked up by the ISS folks. So they were getting requests for taxis. <laughs> <laughs> Given, given the difficulties, that, that would be an extraordinary amount of power. That's more than amateurs normally use. I've got time for one more, and there was a hand over there somewhere. Yes? Yeah, uh, earlier on mentioned that you face really um, Milky Way and need the moon to be in a particular direction to not face it. But I was under the impression that the radiation, that the micro radiation you get from Milky Way would appear from all directions. Uh, it's much more intense if you are pointing towards... The, back, the, the cosmic microwave background radiation is uniform in all directions. And we just deal with that as like a baseline we can't get away from. But the Milky Way, which is our local galaxy, it's a much smaller part, is much closer. If you are pointing an antenna towards... Uh, <clears throat> you can't see it in Singapore. If you, <laughs> if you get out into a, into a rural area... Um, and you look in the right direction at the right time, you'll see a clearly, and that's why it's called the Milky Way, a, a blaze of stars together lighting up the sky. So that is directional. If you're pointing towards the centre of the Milky Way, you'll pick up a lot more noise, and if you're pointing away, a lot less. And of course, it's the same for the light, and it's exactly the same. If you're looking towards, if you're seeing the light of the Milky Way, then you're also seeing the, the radio noise. So it's, that's the difference between noise from the Milky Way versus cosmic microwave background which is indeed on the direction. Wow, thank you.